Okay, so are you ready to, like, step back in time with us? Yeah, we're doing things a little differently this time. A little spooky. Mm -hmm. A deep dive into Oscar Wilde's The Canterville Ghost. Ooh, a classic ghost story. But with a twist. Okay. I'm intrigued. Lay it on me. Well, we're looking at a 1906 illustrated edition. Oh, cool. It's incredible. I mean, the illustrations just add this whole other level. I was going to say, when I think of like old books, sometimes the illustrations can be a little creepy. Oh, for sure. But like in a good way. Yeah. Well, you'll have to let me know what you think. Okay, do. But um, before we get too caught up in the visuals, right. let's set the scene. Okay. So picture this. You have this grand old English manor, right? Quintessential haunted house. Okay, I can see it. And enter the Otis family from America. Oh boy, here we go. Ready to move in and make themselves at home. This is going to be good. Oh, it's brilliant because Wilde sets up this clash of cultures right from the start. Oh, I love that. You have this practical modern family. The Otises. Yeah, and they approach this whole ghost thing with very American skepticism. Well, yeah, I mean, if I was moving into a haunted house, I'd probably be a little skeptical too. Like, yeah. Okay, show me the ghost, then we'll talk. Exactly. That's it's like okay. a ghost, sure we'll take it. As long as the plumbing works. Exactly. <laughs> like, what's the square footage on a haunting anyway right and that's the heart of it isn't it mm. the otises embody this very modern idea that everything can be explained or at least dealt with right like with the right approach even something as intangible as a ghost which brings us to mr otis ah yes the patriarch it seems like a piece of work when he hears the house is haunted he's just like okay well i'll take the ghost at evaluation wait what does that even mean i know right imagine being the ghost so and, sorry, I'm in. And having to like maintain your spooky reputation. With that going on. Exactly. Priceless. But that line, at evaluation, mm. it's so perfect. Why? It just encapsulates that American mindset of the time, you know? Like everything has a price tag. Exactly. Like even something as intangible as a ghost. It's like trying to put a price tag on fear itself. Right. So we've got these very modern Americans moving into a haunted house. And it's not just Mr. Otis. Oh, right. Tell me about the rest of the family. Well, you've got Mrs. Otis, of course, mm. and then their children. How many kids? Three. Washington, the practical son. Okay. Virginia, the daughter with a heart of gold. Oh, I like her already. Okay. And, and we can't forget the twins. Oh, no. Who is up to shenanigans? I bet. The twins are actually referred to as the Stars and Stripes by Wild, which I just love. A little on the nose, don't you think? Maybe, but it's perfect. Okay. Yeah. But before the Otises even encounter Sir Simon... They come face to face with something even more terrifying. Oh, what's scarier than a ghost? The blood stain. The what? The infamous blood stain. Okay, any detail. So it's not just any stain. Okay. This is like Sir Simon's calling card, his grim reminder of the past. Okay, I'm not liking the sound of this. So the housekeeper, Mrs. Um, Kenny, she tells them it's the blood of Lady Eleanor de Canterville. Sir Simon's wife. Who he murdered. Right. And legend has it, it can never be removed. Oh, come on. That's a little dramatic, isn't but it? But remember who we're dealing with here. The fearless, stain-fighting Otises. Exactly. Yeah. They're not about to let a little thing like a centuries-old blood stain. Get in the way of their fresh coat of paint. Exactly. Washington ever, the pragmatist pulls out Pinkerton's champion stain remover. Of course he does. Like a true American hero. This blood stain doesn't stand a chance. It's almost like this epic showdown. You know. Between good and evil. Well, more like the ancient powers of darkness. Versus the cleaning aisle at the Fuji market. Exactly. And just like that, the stain is gone. No way. Gone. It's this little act, but it speaks volumes. Yeah. This clash between the old world and the new. Explain that. Sir Simon, with his ghostly traditions up against a family armed with the latest in stain-removing technology. It's hilarious and kind of sad at the same time. I know, right? Imagine being a ghost... And your big scare tactic is foiled by a bottle of stain remover? What's a ghost to do? I don't know, but I have a feeling Wild is about to tell us. So the Otises are all moved and all set up. You'd think Sir Simon would just give up, you know. Pack his bags and find a new house to haunt. Right. But he's determined to, like, prove he's got some scares left in him. Oh, yeah, this is the good part. It is, and this is where Wild's humor really shines. I mean, the illustrations of Sir Simon's attempts to scare the Otises are just... Okay, okay, let's set the scene. Okay. It's the middle of the night. The Otises are sound asleep. Or so Sir Simon thinks. Right, he's about to unleash his most terrifying ghostly move. Which is? The classic rattling chains down the hallway. Spooky. Right, but not so fast. What happened? 
Mr. Otis, like the practical man he is, he just pops out of bed and offers Sir Simon a bottle of Tammany Rising Sun Lubricator for his chains. No way! Yes way! Can you imagine the look on Sir Simon's face? Talk about a haunting fail. Right. It's like Wilde is saying sometimes the best way to face your fears is to just laugh at them. Exactly. Wilde takes these classic ghost story tropes and turns them on their head. Turns them into comedy gold. And you know, there's something really clever about that. What do you mean? Well, think about what those classic tropes represent. The fear of the unknown. The weight of tradition. And the Otises, they're like, we're modern. We're not afraid of your old-fashioned ghost tricks. Exactly. And that's probably more unsettling to Sir Simon than any scream he could muster. Okay, but Sir Simon, he's got more tricks up his sleeve, right? Oh, he's not done yet. He decides to pull out the big guns, his most terrifying costume. Reckless Rupert, or the Headless Earl. Okay, that sounds pretty scary. Right? This is the costume that supposedly scared a young woman so badly she eloped. This is serious ghost business. This is it. This is the moment the Otises will finally be terrified. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Wilde throws us another curveball. Remember those mischievous twins? How could I forget? The stars and stripe. They're one step ahead of Sir Simon. They rig up a tripwire. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Instead of terrifying the Otises, Sir Simon ends up drenched from a jug of water. You're kidding. Nope. It's like something out of a cartoon. Poor Sir Simon. But you know what's brilliant about all this? What? Wilde makes this question what's truly scary. Is it a ghost rattling chains? Mm -hmm. Or is it, like you said, the fear of being outdated, irrelevant, left behind? That's deep. And it's in the midst of all this chaos, the laughter, the spilled water that we meet Virginia. The Otis daughter. A woman with a heart of gold. And she's different. Very different. While her family sees Sir Simon as this amusing annoyance, Virginia sees something more. What do you mean? She sees his sadness, his pain, and that changes everything. It's so interesting how the family is dealing with this ghost, like some are laughing it off. Right, totally different reactions. And then you have Virginia who's like, no, I see you, ghost, you're sad. Exactly, and it's that compassion that really changes the game. It's like Wilde is saying, hey, even in the most ridiculous situations, remember to be kind. That's really cool. And Virginia, she, he embodies that. Yeah. And there's this scene where she finds Sir Simon in the tapestry chamber looking totally miserable. Aww. He's going on about how he can't find peace, hasn't slept in 300 years. Oh my gosh, I'd be a mess if I couldn't sleep for that long. It's more than that though, right? This deep-seated guilt, the regret he carries. Heavy stuff. And Virginia, how does she react? She asks him, <laughs> Have you no place where you can sleep? Not, here's a glass of warm milk or something. Exactly. She sees his suffering, not just the spooky facade. And that, I think, is what unlocks that mysterious prophecy on the library window. You mean the one that goes, when a golden girl can win? That's it. The one with the golden girl, the almond tree, the child's tears. You know? Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I remember. But it always seemed a little random to me, like thrown in there. It's easy to dismiss it as just another spooky detail but it's actually central to Virginia's role. She becomes the prophecy, in a way. So she's not just feeling bad for Sir Simon, she's going to actively help him find peace. That's the thing, yeah. She weaves for him, prays for him, offers the forgiveness he couldn't find on his own. Wow, and then she disappears with him. Right, talk about a twist. The family is frantic, but just when they think the worst has happened. Virginia reappears. She does. And she leads them to this hidden room where they discover Sir Simon's skeleton, finally at peace. That must have been an intense moment. Powerful imagery. And then, almost like magic, the barren almond tree outside bursts into bloom. No way. As if nature itself is acknowledging the peace that's been found. It's beautiful. But, you know, Wilde leaves things open-ended. What really happened between Virginia and Sir Simon? Did she comfort him? Did something more happen? We don't know for sure. And that's the beauty of it, I think. It sparks those what-if questions long after you finish the story. But hold on, we're not quite done yet. Remember those jewels. Oh, right. Sir Simon's thank you gift to Virginia for, you know, helping him find eternal peace. It's almost like even in death, he's exposing the, shall we say, unique worldview of the Otises. How so? Mr. Otis, ever the pragmatist, wants to return the jewels. Argues that idle luxury has no place in a family raised on good old-fashioned Republican simplicity. He's still trying to apply logic to a situation that completely defies logic. But there's a twist. Lord Canneville insists Virginia keep the jewels. 
recognizes the true value of what she did for his ancestor. So it's not just about material wealth. It's about acknowledging something deeper. Exactly. And that's what makes this story so much more than just a ghost story. We have cultural clashes. We have the absurdity of trying to make sense of the unexplainable. And at the heart of it all, this powerful message of compassion. That even in a world obsessed with the new, there's still a place for empathy, for yeah. kindness. It's a good reminder for all of us. Sometimes the bravest thing you can do is meet fear, not with force, but with understanding. Perfectly said. It makes you wonder, what would happen if we all approached the things that scare us with a little more of Virginia's compassion? That's a wrap on the Cannaville Ghost. Make sure to check out that illustrated edition we talked about, folks.